Welcome to the Jeros Health Podcast, where we make it easy for you to better serve older adults. This is the weekly Jerry on Ice segment that is a collaboration with the Institute of Clinical Excellence, the official Con Ed provider for the Jeros community. Hello, everybody. Christina Previtt here, and I am here for the Wednesday edition of Jerry on Ice. I'm one of the two lead faculty with Dustin Jones for Modern Management of the Older Adult Course. We are going to be in Camarillo, California, end of August, and we're going to be in Minnesota and Torrington in September. I have to get all of my dates <laughs> together. Um, and we are working on a huge revamp of the Modern Management of the Older Adult online course. So more to come on that. Super, super exciting stuff. Um, but we've been doing a lot of research, updating all the literature in our course, and that's going to be reflected in the September cohort. If you've taken our cohort in the past, you will have access to all these updates. So no worries. You don't have to get FOMO about missing out on some of the new material. It is all good. Um, so if you guys don't know, uh, I don't only teach the modern management course. I also teach the uh, clinical management of the fitness athlete pregnancy and postpartum. And so in that course, we talk a lot about some of the issues that can happen from a pelvic health perspective after uh, women have babies. Uh, if you guys don't know, I'm also 12 weeks postpartum. So I'm about three months um, from having my little daughter, Maya. And so I have been living this reality over the last couple of months. And it's gotten me thinking a lot about some of the parallels between some of the issues that we see in the postpartum period and some of the issues that we're seeing in some of our older clients. And so the world of pelvic health has really exploded over the last little while, which is amazing. We're, I would say five or six years ago, seeing a pelvic floor physiotherapist after having a baby was probably fairly rare. And you were very educated around a lot of the things that were happening in uh, terms of the labor and delivery process and some of the things that can happen from a muscular perspective or a fascial ligamentous perspective as the baby descends into the birth canal. Um, so we've done a really good job over the last five or six years of advocating in that area of a woman's life. The other thing though, is that it's not just in that postpartum period that we see a spike in issues like incontinence and prolapse. So two of the biggest risk factors for incontinence are obviously having a vaginal delivery, but the other thing is increasing age. And so we are seeing a lot of people who, as they get older, you know, the pelvic floor is a carriage of muscles that help to support the pelvic organs. And as we lose strength, we talk a lot about functional mobility strength, but the pelvic floor is also a girdle of muscles that needs to be supported in order us in order for us to maintain our continence, um, which is both urinary and fecal continence. And if that doesn't happen, we start experiencing symptoms like leaking of both of both the urethra and the anal sphincters. And so the thing that we see in the geriatrics world is that the uh, cue for transition into long-term care, oftentimes it's a lack of continence that triggers that transition into a nursing home facility or an assisted living facility. And so with Dustin's and my mission around helping geriatric clinicians keep people in their home for longer, aging well, the question of how can we help with this aspect, um, I'm not an internal pelvic floor physical therapist, but it's definitely something that is on my radar. And so I started thinking about, you know, what are the ways that we can start to help? And so the first thing we have to do is define some of the different types of incontinence. So probably the most popular that most people would be fairly familiar with is stress urinary incontinence, which happens when there's an increase in intra-abdominal pressure that uh, causes a leakage of urine. So cough, sneeze, laugh, uh, any type of valsalva can cause a leaking. The second type of incontinence that we see very commonly is called urge incontinence. So that they call it like a key in the door where you all of a sudden have an urge to go to the bathroom. And if you don't get to the bathroom right at that second, you could um, involuntarily void your bladder. And that can lead to a lot of 
social anxieties, feeling like you always need to wear a pad or a diaper, um, things like that in order for you to be able to go out in the community. And it's actually a huge barrier uh, for some people going out at all, unless they know where every single bathroom is. And just like anything in PT, we think that we can put these into nice little boxes, but we also have a mixed incontinence, which has uh, different uh, characteristics of both. So it's not just that you're going to have stress incontinence or you're going to have urge. You can also have a mixed incontinence. And some of the estimates are that almost 50% of uh, individuals, uh, women can have symptoms of incontinence. And we think that this is underreported. Because oftentimes the messaging, especially with my clients who are over 50, was, oh, you've had a baby. That's totally fine. That happens. Oh, you've had kids. Like, you know, that's just something that happens. Or, oh, that's just something that happens with age. And that's one of the ones that I hate. Just because you're over the age of 50 does not mean you should be leaking urine when you cough or sneeze. And so there's actually a fourth type of incontinence that we don't really talk about a lot, and that's functional incontinence. So these, this type of incontinence is a leaking of urine or fecal matter that happens when individuals are aware that they have to go to the bathroom, but there's some sort of underlying issue that may prevent that, um, that ability to go to a bathroom or seek out a bathroom. And so I, I hate the word functional incontinence because it's almost like lack of function incontinence. And so this can be things like muscular weakness. So if you don't have the strength to get up out of your chair, when you feel like, oh, I have to go to the bathroom, then you need to call for somebody to help you call for a family member. By the time they get there, it could be too late. And then you're voiding your bladder. That's an example of functional incontinence. Another thing could be something like cognitive impairment where you're getting the trigger from your brain, but it's not pro- like their processing speed isn't there. So if you're in an acute care setting, for example, and you're seeing somebody with cognitive impairment, their incontinence may not be related to something structural at the level of the pelvic floor, but it could be something that's happening in terms of processing those signals from a cognitive perspective. And so as a non-internal pelvic floor therapist and recognizing that this functional incontinence is related to functional mobility, what can we do in the world of geriatrics to help? And so one of the first things I think we need to do is start advocating. So the world of pelvic health has done a great job in the pre postnatal period, but I feel like there isn't as much information that's helping as in, as especially women go through menopause, they're seeing a huge change in their sex hormones. And that's going to be, um, one of those triggers for an increase in risk for, uh, urinary incontinence symptoms or men who have had issues with prostate. So it could be an enlarged prostate, prostate cancer, any sort of um, issue that's happened with their prostate increases their risk of incontinence symptoms. And oftentimes we focus a lot of our messaging on women. So how can we as therapists be trying to speak to our, our, um, our clients, our potential clients, in regards to trying to say, like, you know, this is not just a pre post baby period. So one of the things that we've done at stave off, um, I work with Kelsey Valentine, who is an internal pelvic floor therapist is I wrote a article for the seniors association in our town. So there's a distribution of about 5,000 all over the age of 60. And what I said was, you know, did you know that this isn't normal? It, It is common, but it doesn't have to be your normal. I said, did you also know that the first line of treatment shouldn't be medications? And that's often what happens is a person over the age of 60 will go complaining of bladder symptoms. And this is in the Canadian context. So I don't know if it's the same in the U.S. And they'll be giving a medication that changes the flow of urine through the kidneys and through the bladder. And so instead of treating the muscular issues that are going on in terms of maintaining continence, they're given a medication that changes flow. And so if they have less flow into the bladder, then the idea is that they'll have less leakage and therefore it'll help with some of their symptoms of incontinence. And in terms of where the research is, there is a higher level of evidence for conservative management of pelvic floor dysfunction uh, with the use of pelvic floor muscular training than there is for any other modality and any other medication. And I have a lot of clients who come in who are on these medications who hate the side effects. So one of the things that we as PTs can do is say, you know, there is another way. It doesn't have to be that you are, you know, having to be on another medication in a world where we're already over prescribing. So a way that we can do that is start to advocate. The second thing is as an outpatient orthopedic therapist, I can start talking to my clients about this 
early. So I'm not in home health where I'm seeing people later down the line. I'll talk about this a little bit later, but as an outpatient orthopedic therapist, I see people who are still relatively independent. Most of them have been able to drive independently into my clinic. I have had um, their spouse, they're fairly cognitively intact, potentially mildly cognitive, cognitively impaired, but have that. And the idea is that if I can start talking about incontinence, which could be, you know, if I've seen someone with back pain, I can ask about, you know, are you experiencing any leaking symptoms, whether it be a fecal matter or um, urine, are you having any pain with intercourse, those type of questions, which oftentimes, unfortunately, um, it's a lot of awkwardness on the side of the clinician to be asking those type of questions, but it's super important. Or I can put a very quick screening questionnaire into my um, original package for when individuals come in for an assessment. And if there's anything that is flagged there, then it's a really quick transition into that conversation around, did you know that the pelvic floor is a set of muscles and just like we can have strains or overuse or weakness in one muscle, this is the same is true for your pelvic floor. And then potentially I'm at least giving that education around, you know, there is something else that you can do and I'm doing it more upstream. You know, there's a common theme across the ICE faculty where we are thinking, you know, we are reacting, but we are also trying to encourage proactive healthcare strategies. The APHPT and Mike Eisenhart are the gurus. And the idea is, you know, can we start talking about this, not just after a woman has had a baby, but as as they transition through menopause, for example, when they're seeing us in their 50s, can we start re-bringing up these conversations and saying, you know, this is another period in your life where you may be experiencing symptoms. And so if down the road, they're starting to have issues with stress urge, mixed or functional incontinence, then it can lead to a conversation that can lead to conservative management versus using other medications. The other thing is that as we as geriatric clinicians go down the line, so I'm in outpatient orthopedics where I'm seeing people at a probably an increased um, functional resiliency and threshold, I'm going to be trying to optimize their functional resiliency so that they don't ever have to get into a point of functional incontinence. But as you're starting to go down the line and you're seeing individuals in home or who are clinicians in home health, acute care, skilled nursing facilities, where individuals have a, a less functional resiliency than the people that I would see potentially, and they're getting closer to that line of a loss of functional independence, then how can we start to try to encourage different pelvic floor strategies for individuals who may have a muscular weakness component to their incontinence? And so we have strategies for non-internal pelvic floor therapists. An example is uh, Julie Weeb's Blow Before You Go. And so how many of us in home health, acute care, or SNF are actually for individuals who aren't cognitively impaired and isn't going to cause a processing overload? How many of us are actually cueing on breathing for our older clients, especially if we know that there is an incontinence issue going on? Because the pelvic floor is an anticipatory muscular contraction. So if we start to exhale, the pelvic floor muscles are going to contract before exertion happens. And that exertion is usually when that intra-abdominal pressure increases and we start to see a leakage. And so if we can start inc incorporating that very easily, if we're doing a sit to stand, say, you know... Mary, I want you to blow out, breathe out before you stand up. And then you kind of get that contraction. Then we may already be setting them up for a better continent status without really having to do any sort of internal pelvic floor work. And as geriatric clinicians, we can potentially keep them in their homes for longer if we know that, you know, lack of continent status is one of the things that is going to trigger that transition into long-term care and that loss of independence. And so just something that I've been thinking about as I feel like I have this beautiful crossover between some of the things that we talk about in the postpartum female and some of the things that we talk about in the older, um, older clientele, men and women who are experiencing incontinence symptoms and how can we blend those and how can we advocate for a lifelong, you know, um, advocacy for the role of physical therapists in this area. And then how can me, myself as a non-internal pelvic floor therapist, one who doesn't really want to do internal pelvic floor, that's not really my jam. Um, how can I still continue to help my clients? Sometimes it's just about having a conversation. But the second thing is that we do have strategies for non-internal therapists to start encouraging the strengthening of some of those pelvic floor muscles or relaxing them if 
necessary. So just my thought process for today. I would love to hear your guys' opinions, especially if you are in, you know, acute care, home health, skilled nursing facilities. This is probably something that you guys see all the time. Probably some of your PT work often is taking your clients to the bathroom and back. And so how can we start to encourage these conversations around um, incontinence and the pelvic floor muscles being a weakness issue? in a more of an upstream way to try and prevent some of these transitions into um, a skilled nursing or assisted living facility. I think that's something that we as physical therapists can really work on and it takes a tribe to start doing changing the, the mantras and start changing the conversations. So I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on this. This is kind of me rambling about my ideas that are ruminating in my head around what we can do. Um, so, you know, let me know if you've had any success with this. I would love to hear your guys' opinions. Other than that, I hope you guys have a wonderful, wonderful Wednesday. If you are hoping to get onto some of the modern management of the older adult online courses, our next one starts September 22nd. And so um, if you were thinking about what you want to do for your fall CEUs, this is a great one. I'm biased, but I think it's awesome. And so um, let me know if you have any questions about the modern management course. Otherwise, I will see you all in a couple of weeks. Bye. Thank you for listening to the weekly Jerry on Ice segment of the Jaros Health Podcast. If you found this episode helpful, you should go to jaroshealth.com to check out our course offerings that will make it easy for you to better serve older adults. Once again, that's G-E-R-O-S health.com and click on the courses tab. Thanks for listening.